You good? Yep, have a seat. So we got this one. Thank you. Thank, can you hear me okay? I'm going to move. These folks are going to pass around their microphone. You're going to. I didn't. Yeah, now we're in. Okay, good. That works. All right, I, I don't need a mic. I'll let you hand it off to, yeah. to different people. So the way we're going to do this panel discussion, I'm going to ask the panelists to, no? We, can we, should we kill the screen, Yvonne? No. Okay, kill the screen. Derek, you don't need can we do that? Can we kill the logo? That's fine. Okay, so I can move. I just don't want to stand in front of anybody while they're, you know. But I will. So I will moderate the panel. I'll ask them to introduce themselves and explain why they're on the panel, what expertise they bring. And we have experts here, all types. Uh, if they end up talking too long, I'll give them a. And uh, so we can get this done by 11.45 and beyond to, to lunch. Um, and then I have questions from the audience and uh, questions that I brought you know, ready in case the audience didn't have any. We got plenty of questions. I'll give you all plenty of time to talk, but I will try to move, move you along so everyone has a chance to say something. But use the microphone so we get this on our streaming uh, video. Um, so great panelists. John, if you'd hand me the microphone, I'll start here to my left, your right. And we'll just move right down the line, line introduce yourself. and. How's it going? Uh, my name is Jason Emmel. Uh, John invited me out here. Uh, I've known him for over 10 years now in, in the fisheries world, but also uh, because of my involvement in Virginia bow fishing. Um, I started with a small group of friends uh, just as a way to organize tournaments and uh, go out on different trips together. I started a Facebook group in 2014 called Virginia Bow Fishing Association. Um, it was originally maybe 15 to 20 people. Uh, fast forward to today, I checked it this morning, it's 810 members. That's not to say that there's that many individuals bow fishing in Virginia. Some of that is people from neighboring states, um, people with boats who've added their friends over the years. But it's really become uh, more than I ever imagined it would be. It's, it's sort of blossomed into a a community where we can organize events. We do some outreach uh, things throughout the year, and um, it's really it's really turned into something that uh, that I'm pretty proud of. And I, I've I've met a lot of neat people um, through my involvement in bow fishing. So hopefully I can answer some of your questions if you have any on uh, the sport of bow fishing or particular issues to Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ray Fernald. I'm the manager of environmental programs at the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, and I'm the chair of the Mid-Atlantic panel on aquatic invasive species. So I uh, start off with I'm neither a snakehead expert nor a fisheries biologist at all. So, uh, but I do have some experience with the uh, invasive species. Uh, for about the last 40 years, first in Florida for 13 years, South Florida and in Virginia now for the last uh, 28 years. Uh, I've handled environmental issues primarily, done some research on invasives and exotic species. And over the last 40 years, my activities in invasives have ranged from anywhere from 10 to 100% uh, of my time, just depending on what the situation of the day was. So I'm just here to provide that perspective as I can. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. I'm Josh Newhart. I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service out of Annapolis, and I've been doing snakehead research in some capacity over the past uh, 10 years, so I've done a lot of work with a lot of folks on the panel here, so hopefully I can answer your questions, too. I'm Joe Love. I work with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Fishing and Boating Services. I was trained as an ichthyologist, ichthyologist, but now I'm a, now I'm a fishery scientist. I uh, sit with our invasive species matrix team, helped author the aquatic nuisance species plan for the state, and uh, primarily uh, started working with largemouth bass, uh, but then I started working with snakehead because we had bass anglers who were concerned about that species, and so I've been doing that for about 10 years now. John Odenkirk, I'm a biologist with Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. And I've been working in Northern Virginia, and I was here when snakeheads showed up in 2004. And I've been 
working with snakeheads ever since then, trying to investigate impacts and see where we're going with the population and the ecology. And so I'm, I'm sort of in the middle, the middle of sort of a, a little bit of a, Don referenced an S storm earlier. And uh, essentially, I'm just trying to keep it real. Don talked about trust and, and uh, I, you know, I'm not here to tell anyone the snake kids are good. I'm not here to tell you they're bad. We got them. We're not going to get rid of them. Uh, we're going to have to learn how to live with them. And all I'm trying to do is figure out what they're doing. And if that means telling people they taste good, I'm not going to lie to them. I'm not going to tell them don't eat them. They, they taste good. Uh, so we've had our own internal discussions. I, I've given so many lectures on snake kids to people, non-professional, professional, I can't even remember. Uh, I used to start my lectures with, to me, the word invasive is a pretty subjective word, and it can be interpreted different by a lot of different people, and some things that you think are invasive, other people aren't going to think so, and we can go back and forth with that all day long. Uh, that being said, the federal government has adopted a specific definition of invasive as it relates to potentially injurious fish, which I may not ne necessarily agree with, but I have, I have resigned to the fact that I will call them potentially invasive. Uh, or, or maybe even invasive with the federal definition is my caveat. Uh, but that being said, again, I, I'm just trying to keep it as real as I can uh, and, and let anglers and constituents know what's going on. Hi, my name is Jonathan Levitt. Um, John asked me to be here to represent the recreational kayak anglers. Um, I've been fishing for these guys since about 2009. In fact, Steve was my first introduction to him, I booked a trip with him because I realized I had no idea what I was doing. Um, from the get-go, I was a proponent of these guys, uh, which garnered a lot of hate messages and hate mail from my videos and uh, social media posts. Um, I've done a couple videos with John, um, some question and answers, and just to kind of spread the truth. Um, and you know, the, when it first started the, me the uh, media uh, hysteria, there was a lot of you know, unfounded truths that were out there. So my whole goal has been to kind of, you know, embrace these guys and just stop the indiscriminate killing of them. Uh, I'm Captain Steve Chaconis. I'm a Coast Guard licensed uh, charter boat captain. I specialize in largemouth bass and uh, I've been around sort of since the beginning when the hysteria started and uh, kind of funny, the first time I ever got interviewed, a, a reporter asked me, she said, so, when you caught your first snakehead, what'd you think it was? And I said, well, I'd never seen one before. I, I didn't know, it was mean, it was ugly, it was nasty, it was slimy. I thought I'd hooked a lawyer, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, we cut it open, we saw it had a heart, we knew it wasn't a lawyer. But uh, we, uh, was that for you? I, I, you love, I love fishing for snakeheads, it's something I've always wanted, uh, want my clients to experience, because it is a lot of fun. Uh, the creek that John uh, does most of his uh, uh, surveying is a creek that I have fished since the 1960s. So it's kind of interesting for me to see all the, all the biomass and all the diverse species in that, in that creek when we go out electroshocking, but also learning as much as we can. And I think when the, when the species first was uh, discovered, a lot of the old timers, uh, the old guides say, oh, well, you know, our, our American bass will kick the Chinese butt out of that thing, you know? But, <laughs> Learning information that don't eat babies, well, they don't eat six-month-olds, they eat them when they're younger, but they, they don't eat babies, they don't walk on land, and uh, in fact, uh, West Virginia, um, I fish a lot in West Virginia too, and they have a different approach to going after uh, snakeheads. They tell, they tell all the West Virginians that you can't catch them, you can't eat them, and you need a special license, and they're going to wipe them out that way, I think. But, uh, but I, I have a different approach uh, than Jonathan does. We use a hook and a line to, to try to get them, which gives us uh, a lot of limitations, uh, but we do have strategies that, that do work. Uh, I had a guy out two weeks ago who is a species hunter. He has 840 species under his belt right now. Snakehead was one that he he knocked off his list, and uh, he did that with a hook and line. Uh, but he also, he said, what else do you have here? And I went through all the other species. He said, I got that, got that, got that. And he says, what do snakeheads eat? And I said, well, they eat banded killifish. He said, well, let's go after them. So, <laughs> so we went after banded killifish, and he pulled out a number 24 hook with a little worm on it, and he caught one. But uh, be glad to answer any questions on angling for, for snakeheads. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm Jimmy Barnett. I am the 
ANS coordinator, aquatic nuisance species coordinator for the Arkansas Game and Fish. Uh, I've been in the agency ever since our start with the snakehead uh, venture back in uh, 2008. And the reason I'm up here on the panel today is, is I'm actually replacing Greg Conover, who is the coordinator for the Mississippi River Basin Panel on Aquatic Nuisance Species. And so I'm gonna try to fill in, in on his shoes. Great, thank you. So you see on our, our panel here, well selected, over a hundred years of experience with snakeheads. Uh, the only person who wasn't able to show up uh, was Tim Segru from Congressional Seafoods, and so we, we don't have that perspective. If anyone in the audience, you know, wishes to speak to that, uh, he's he's in the marketing and uh, sale of uh, snakehead as a food fix. So I'll start with questions here, and then um, some of these will be directed at individuals. Other ones. I'll ask you to raise your hand and uh, jump right in. So this first one is from Vampira, the snakehead uh, queen, says uh, her, her opinion is ex expansion seems to be inevitable, uh, uh, so we need a toolkit available for biologists uh, to deal with the public inquiries. So uh, how can we accomplish this? Who wishes to take on that one? I didn't say they'd be easy questions. <laughs> You're ready. That's a terrible one, yeah. Uh, so, you know, in Maryland, we dealt with a lot, I deal with a lot of public inquiries. I almost deal with a phone call every day from a snakehead angler. Our toolkit, really, our first step was creating uh, messaging that everyone could agree to. Um, a policy was very important for the department to make sure we are on the same consistent page, not only with our governor's office, but also with surrounding states and the Fid uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. So having a message, step one in the toolbox. Secondly, develop an outreach strategy. We needed to engage the fishery, so we had to identify who those fishery people were. Once we did, we could customize uh, outreach materials for those particular groups, uh, show up at their fishing, op you know, at their fishing engagements and generally talk with the people about what they're seeing on the water and address their concerns. So basically you need a point person or several people to take in questions, but uh, having a message to, um, to convey to them that everyone agrees to is very important. Thank you, yeah, Kathy can go. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, I think from my perspective, the issue right now isn't presenting a message necessarily, because we've had lots of years of experience in presenting messages. The question is, I don't think we have a consistent message. And that it gets a little bit to what Don has said in his presentation. And what I found, I, I gave half a dozen talks on invasive species for a year, and my talks have evolved over the years to now, y you know, 15 years ago, my talk ba was based on the evils of all invasive species and uh, why they're bad and what they are and what they're doing wrong and how to get rid of them. Now my talk is more based on these are, these are invasive, non-native species, not, not all fish, mostly mm -hmm. not fish, um, but somebody loves this thing. And mm -hmm. so the problem is it's, it's a matter of perspective, it's a matter of your values, as Don point out. So I think what we need to do now is we're beginning to gather enough information that we need to have a consistent message. We can't be, we can't be encouraging a recreation and commercial harvest and think that that's going to be encouraging those same people not to move them around. So those are just two okay. facts that we have to deal with and figure out what our message needs to be, either at a regional or a drainage or a local level. All right, thank you. That, that was one of the things that we talked about w way back when we were all on the panel. I think uh, Joe and, and uh, John were in on it, and the feds, you know, I said, hey, guys, why don't we just tell everybody they taste good and that. But our biggest concern was moving them around. How do you deliver those two messages? So back then we decided, hey, we're not going to say anything good about the snakeheads. It's all going to be that they're terrible. We need to eradicate them. All right. Thank you. All right. Randy's panelists. You want to do it? Can wait. Okay. One one comment on what Steve just said. I mean, that's going to be a little bit of an issue with trust in terms of our constituents, right? We're we're basically lying to them then. Of 
course you can. Thank you. That's one thing that one. Ray said about, you said people are starting to love them is, in the beginning, I was a part of a very small group that kind of saw the benefits and, and, and embraced them as a game fish. And every single year, that group is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you know, I think now it's fair to say that the majority of the average angler embraces these things and wants to go catch them and wants to go find them. Yeah, I, I, I want to I wanna follow up on that, too. I want to fighting for the Yeah, mic, since, the, since the introduction and all the media hype and all the publicity, I, my phone was, was ringing off the hook with people wanting to come out and catch snakeheads. These weren't fishermen. These were just people wanting something novel to do. And as, as such, for me, my job was really tough because they didn't have the necessary skills. What's happened now is that you have serious anglers who will fly in from all over the world to come here because they know they have a chance of catching a world record uh, in the Potomac River, and they come here specifically for that, and they're actually better anglers doing that. I'm gonna wait late just for a minute. So two things, and I'll pass it down. <clears throat> you know, we're, we're stewards of the resource, number one, but number two, we have constituents, and our constituents are license, license holders, whether they're bow fishing or, or hook and line fishing, we have to make sure those anglers are happy, and, and, and there is a shift in angler behaviors and attitudes. We've seen it in our krill surveys on the tidal Potomac. We've gone from 0% people targeting snakeheads to 2% uh, in the most recent survey, which is, doesn't seem like a big number, but we're talking about tens of thousands of people targeting snakeheads. So we have seen a shift in angler behavior and acceptance, and it's going to continue. And, and, and so we have to be cognizant of that as, as managers of the resource while maintaining the ecological balance if we can uh, in concert with that uh, with the fishing well i was gonna say and yeah, well and you mentioned john that builds we already kind of failed on the trust aspect right because if we're not gonna if we were just gonna call them all bad in the beginning then now that they're not as bad as everybody said they were supposedly then so we're fighting that uphill battle now with trust because people want to say well look they're not as bad so so we do have that growing contingent of people of catch and release but like ray said then that's you really got to have a clear, direct message then. Okay, it's okay to catch and release these things if you want. We're not legally requiring you, but don't move them around. So that message, that's a lot harder sell, though, to make that message because people are going to say, well, you're saying that there's no impact, so it's okay if I move them. So making that sell and that message, that is, you really got to be direct and clear with that. And if I want, I don't think this is working it's now. It's on. Is it, it is. It's a... Uh, one issue I always have is we may not be seeing impact in a river system that has already been impacted by multitudes of, of non-native species for decades, but that doesn't mean that they wouldn't have a significant impact if they got into wide, shallow marsh systems or vernal pond systems or other systems that they haven't reached yet. So we g that's where I think we've got to be cognizant about where they're going to, not just where they are. And I just want to kind of follow up on this. Um, I do think we have a consistent message. I, I do think so. I think, you know, Virginia and Maryland both have aquatic nuisance species plans that by policy list northern snakehead as a nuisance species. Fish and wildlife list the species as injurious wildlife. So regardless of personal opinion, our states, whom we represent, recognize them as nuisance species and the federal government recognizes them as an injured species. So regardless of impacts, and you're, and you're right, we're definitely concerned about the expansion. Our message is this species is a nuisance species, injurious wildlife, invasive. I get the subjective argument there, but um, what we need to do is prevent their expansion. And right now, unless someone else here has a wonderful idea, and I'm, I'm open-minded, right now the only thing that we can do to get CPH down to 0.5 or induce recruitment over fishing is engage anglers and archers. Come up with another idea and give it to me, but that's the only one we that's got. Good. Thank, thank you for that comment. But it's important to re recognize it's not like nothing has been done. There are rules in the states and rules in the federal government um, and the other, kind of put this in context, 2004, it's only 14 years ago. So as invasive species go, a 14-year beginning, 14-year uh, beginning of that is a pretty short time frame for 
information to, to be generated and understand. So I'm going uh, uh, to go to another question, see if anyone wants to take this. This one is from Nick Schlesher, and uh, excuse me for paraphrasing it wrong probably, but Schlesser. Uh, Schlesser. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Nick, thanks. But Nick is asking, because he, in anticipating your comment about them, they, get, they will get spread, and where they go next, it may not be some place like the Potomac River. It may be something with a threatened or endangered species. So is anyone working on, you know, technology, species sele selective toxicant or YY males strategies that would target uh, snakehead, to eliminate snakehead in a particular thing, other than, you know, the, the rote known? Toxicant. Anyone know of anything going on in this part? And this could be a question for the panel or anyone in the room. Ideas with the YY. Why? Oh, yeah. Great. Right, it's got to be a biosecure facility. Just a quick thought about that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in that world with other species, and some of those technologies might be transferable, and but coming down the pipe, but it's going to be decades. Yeah. Thank you, Dwayne. All right, so I've got a question fr from Dwayne here um, for uh, Jimmy Barnett and Joe Love, uh, and basically it's focus in on what is that one thing, two, what are the key things we don't know now that we need to know in order to better understand risk and, and obviously this is in your local context you know so you can speak to that from the arkansas standpoint Dwayne, to answer that question things that we don't know is what effect are they going to have on our native fish on our on our natural assemblage out here and uh from the arkansas side of that the areas that we have snakeheads in right now historically have been areas that, that our fish biologists don't have assemblage data or, or population data from. So, uh, you know, we've got to gather some data. We're, we're having to get it from where they're already at. So to really get a, a firm effect, it's going to be hard to do. Send me some personnel. <laughs> <laughs> An army, maybe? <laughs> I, I think along the same lines, that's, that's kind of our concern as well. You know, snakeheads now are entering non-tidal waters and trout waters, and there's some concern over um, community-level impacts. Uh, you know, we do have some s relatively small populations of species like Chesapeake log perch that are endemic, um, as well as banded, killi uh, banded sunfish which we don't have many of. And uh, we don't want to lose them like we lost the Maryland darter. So we have to pay attention to what those possible impacts are going to be right now. ISIL presented some great research, right, with 2,000 um, individual snakehead cut up. So we got to see really what their diet impacts are going to be. But right now, most of that work is limited to tidal waters. And what we like to see is more non-tidal stuff so we can perhaps understand those impacts. Uh, to your point, Duane, uh, one of the main things I think we need to work on now is understanding more about the user groups of snakeheads. I know um, a lot of work has been done in daytime creel surveys, um, but that's entirely missing one of the largest uh, constituents in, in the game, and that's those that go out at night only um, and generally, as a group, try to fly under the radar and um, stay out of, the, out of the public light. Um, there's pretty high harvest, uh, certainly through the bow fishing group, and I think uh, being able to capture that and understand how that's impacting populations and tributaries of the Potomac and other areas in Virginia, Maryland, uh, I think that's another th uh, a piece of the puzzle that's going to help us move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. One of the memorable slides from this symposium was was Jason with all of those uh, bowfish. I don't know how many were in there, but it was it, you know, quantifies the, the nature of the harvest. Um, what Jason just said, there's such a behavioral difference between 
a night and snakehead and a daytime snakehead. I, I went out one time, and it was they, they just didn't move, and they were everywhere. And if you go out there in the daytime, I mean, it's you're literally hunting them, and you're quiet. But it's complete opposite. They're almost like a completely different fish between nighttime and daytime. Yeah, thank you. All right, so I have another question here uh, from an unknown uh, person, uh, but. Uh, those of you who w uh, read the Washington Post, uh, this past weekend there was an opinion article uh, by an angler, and it was entitled, Stop Killing Potomac Snakeheads. So here we are, you know, in an invasive, talking about them in, as an invasive and their impact, and this person's opinion was absolutely clear, stop killing them. So anyone on the panel, probably everyone on the panel, m would want to react to that. What are your thoughts about this because it's you know it's very timely. You're all experts. If you don't care to comment, just pass it down the mic. <laughs> <laughs> in, in in my business, it, it's not good for business for me to insist that someone kill a fish. Uh, most people out there are, are conservation minded. However, uh, I am uh, aware that we don't want to spread the fish, so we do not keep any live snakeheads. And I give people the option. To keep a snakehead, I encourage them to keep a snakehead, and we can uh, destroy the the snakehead, and then they can. I carry big trash bags on board, and I roll them up in the trash bag, stick them in the in the cooler, and then they're they're good to go. But we we don't intentionally. It's not part of my business model to, uh, nor do I have a cutting board or the utensils to decapitate these fish. Uh, I usually have to stick them in the live well and let them bleed out in there. Thank you. Uh, as I said before, I, I started um, not releasing all of my fish. Um, well, not all of them. I mean, I would keep some to um, you know eat. But one thing you have to remember is we're fishing out of the Potomac, and that is an incredibly diverse, um, fruitful ecosystem. So something like you know closed off system like maybe Lake Anna may, or is going to be different. Um, but should we kill them? Um, no, <laughs> you know I. I I, I don't think I don't think we should, but Grant, I'm not a scientist. Um, in the beginning, there was just so much indiscriminate killing. I mean, people were almost damn near torturing these things, and I think that's that's where my point of view started. Where, you know, I mean, I understand taking it to eat, but you know, to there was videos out there of people you know, throwing them on railroad tracks. I mean, it was pretty bad stuff. Um, and thankfully, we're not seeing that stuff. But, you know, I think that in any other closed system, yeah, I mean, it could they could be incredibly harmful, but, you know, we're lucky to have such a diverse, fruitful system on the Potomac. I saw the editorial. Uh, I thought it was, um, I think my words were magnificent. Um, <laughs> I, I, the guy, he made some fantastic points from his perspective, and uh, it was time for it to be said, I think, in, in a more open form. Um, again, not that I agree completely with it. I don't agree with making it a game fish, which was uh, what he was proposing. Um, but uh, I thought some of the points he made were, were, were well made. I agree with John. I, I think there were some good talkable points there, but I had a different reaction than he did. Um, you know, Maryland, we don't compel anyone to kill snakehead. Um, catch and release is fine. We were definitely encouraging, or we definitely encourage it in part because early on most people didn't even want to touch it. And I think we've been successful in convincing them otherwise. Um, they've come a long way convincing themselves as well. Um, in terms of the Washington Post article, I immediately thought of our Nutria program on the Eastern Shore. And I thought, well, how wonderful of an idea to stop a control program for a nuisance species just as it's showing signs of working, mm -hmm. which is essentially what that um, author was suggesting, that because the control program or this catch and kill idea is resulting in fewer snakehead on the Potomac River, we need to stop that program. And if, by way of something, the population rebounds, we institute the program again. You guys are professionals. You understand in fishery management, perhaps, that it's not a light switch. We can't turn on and off social behaviors. And we can't oscillate from a state perspective one way or the other because it's flippant and doesn't generate trust. So in, in part, I looked at that article and I thought, John's correct. It is time we discussed that. Um, 
but as far as I'm concerned, if we addressed invasive species the way that author addressed snakehead, then we would be getting nowhere with invasive species control in this country. Yeah. Just to clear the record, I wasn't implying that we adopt the no-kill policy. I, I, I think the policy we have in terms of our, our exploitation is, is, a, is, is excellent, and it's one of the reasons we're seeing lower abundances is due to increased exploitation, both from the commercial and recreational standpoints. So, I mean, right now, it's, the glass is half full because Jonathan's happy, Steve's happy, they're catching enough snakeheads, they don't seem to be expanding anymore. So, I mean, times are good, I guess, you know, right now, right? Well, kind of along those lines, I didn't read the article. I actually only heard about it when uh, here, when the symposium started. But uh, right, I thought it was a little ironic to say, let's stop the control program that's working. The control program in place is angling. So it's people, it's exploiting the resource, right? So that's keeping, potentially, it seems that way, at least keeping abundance at a manageable level. So to, to stop that, if abundance were to get out of control, once we start seeing those negative impacts, as has been documented in many times throughout natural resource history, it's a little too late at that point. You know, once an endangered species is gone, we're not bringing them back. So, you know, to stop the control program, and that said, this whole time that there's been some sort of control going on, you've seen the maps today, they've spread at a rate that has not slowed down since they showed up, and it's been either linear or exponential, depending on your point of view, and there's a lot more watershed left to, to infiltrate there, so it would be a little bit uh, short-sighted if we were to stop that, that now. I, I agree pretty much with what uh, Josh, Joe, and, and John have all said. Uh, three J's in a row there, how do you do that? Um, but my take on the article, and I did read it um, when it came out, my first uh, reflection was to review the comments to the article that followed. And I think that that was the issue that, that I took notice of because that gets to how do we handle the social media? We can't. We just have to recognize that it's out there, but what we have to do is turn the public trust around to where they listen to us in, instead of to whatever might happen to appear in an, in an article like this. Uh, to say stop killing northern snakehead in the Potomac um, when you're bow fishing, there is no catch and release. <laughs> <laughs> so to say stop killing them would mean to stop pursuing them stop, altogether. Stop bow fishing. Um, and I, I will say that, that the presence of snakehead in the Potomac and other areas of Virginia is one of the major driving forces of, of the rise in popularity of bow fishing uh, in our area. Most of it's concentrated around the Northern Virginia, Fredericksburg, Richmond corridor, owing a lot to the presence of snakehead, which is probably the, the favorite fish to pursue of most people in the state, I would imagine. And so to say stop doing it would, would really knock the wind out of the sails for a lot of people. So I expected you to you know, write an op-ed to the Washington Post almost immediately because it, your, your group obviously you know, can't live with that. Yeah, I want to just m mention to, uh, to to Ray, uh, you and Steve are the only ones whose names don't be, doesn't don't begin with J on the panel, and that was so you're in the min minority. <laughs> and what's kind of funny is there, there there used to be an immense amount of tension between uh, hook and line and the uh, bow guys. Um, <laughs> you know we you know we there used to be a lot of tension. Now we're we're seeing. That there's just there's a good population out there that you know even though you know these guys are going in and and killing them there's still plenty of them out there and that's kind of what you know and, and we're starting to see working together you know on on that. Thank you. So, so I have a question and and I think maybe somebody in the audience can chime in the panel can chime in. Uh, I, it's just curious to me you know as we've increased the penalty for moving live snakeheads. You know, and it's been in place for a while, so people should know about the rules and know about the penalties. Thousand dollars per single live fish. Why are people moving snakeheads today? And Ray's got an answer. Well, got to come. I'm not going to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question directly, but I want to point out that there's actually 
a much tougher fine in Virginia. It's $25,000 per incident because they are listed as an aquatic nuisance species mm -hmm. under a separate law. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very high penalty if you're caught releasing yeah. snakeheads or uh, deterring our department from pursuing control management or eradication or investigation of snakehead releases. Okay. Anyone else in the panel want to comment on non-compliance? with a serious penalty? I think the answer is simple. It's the, these things are so resilient. You know, they, they can survive and they're easy to move. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a lot easier than taking a five pound bass out of Potomac and putting it in your pond. Um, they'll live for days. You know, I think that, that's a simple answer. Okay. And you can hide them too under your trunk. <laughs> it's easy to hide. I know Dennis has something to share. At least. At least in Mississippi, when we make it a severe fine like that, part of our reasoning is it's a deterrent value. We know that we're not going to, conservation officers cannot be everywhere. But if I tell you that you, you call me up, you want to put tilapia in your pond, I say, look, if you get caught doing that, it's a $2,000 to $5,000 fine. You're going to spend five days in jail. And we're going to take away your hunting, fishing, and licensing privileges for a year. Now you think about that. Is it worth the risk? And so sometimes you need that as purely a deterrent factor. Yeah. Is Nick Lapointe and from Canada? <laughs> Thanks, Don. Well, I mean, I think this is just a wicked issue in invasive fish management. I mean, this is something that's it's not a snakehead inherent problem. We have yeah. smallmouth bass being moved around Nova Scotia and northern Ontario, uh, black crappie everywhere. Um, this practice is probably accelerating among anglers, uh, just with everyone's having more equipment and, and access and everything, everything like that. And it's not something that we've found an answer to. Uh, lots of jurisdictions have tried fines uh, but the reality is if someone wants to poach, if someone wants to evade the law, our, our outdoor spaces are so big, and if you're not a dumbass about it, you can get away with it. Uh, I could probably stock 100 or 1,000 lakes with whatever species I wanted and not get caught. Uh, so I don't have an answer to it, but thinking back to your talk, Don, I mean, this is, this is a question that needs social research. You know, how do we get anglers to not adopt this behavior? How do we change behavior and fines may not be, certainly they can't be the only answer. So I don't think we have the toolkit yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nick. I know there was a recent uh, discovery of snakehead in the reservoirs in the James River drainage. Any intelligence on how that happened? Anyone? Yeah. We have another hand up here. Yeah, we've uh, been pretty good at keeping Nick LaPointe across the other side of the border. But, <laughs> um, I, I think a reward uh, system might be good, too. Uh, I, everywhere I go, I, 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 like I said, now in West Virginia, they have signs uh, at, their, at their boat launches to watch out for snakeheads. Don't introduce this fish in there. And they, I think they even list some of the fines. That may be okay, but I think if we really want to stop it, putting a reward for some for turning somebody in who's actually doing this, uh, I think that's probably how the guy in Virginia was caught. I, I think John, yeah, if you can add to that. Actually, he he was caught because he was an idiot. He was bragging to people. I think he posted on Facebook, <laughs> or, and he admitted to the conservation officer. Um, unfortunately, that was before the the fine was increased or the penalty was increased, but um. Yeah, this day and age, apparently, our, our CPOs make a lot of cases just based on, on stupidity. Okay, Josh, Josh, John. Well, I was going to follow up kind of what, what Nick said, and it was going back to Don, your talk. You know, some of it goes back to messaging and trust. You know, if we're not, we're just trying to say, well, don't do it, don't do it. That message is not going to reach every part of the community. Some folks are still ignorant to the rules. They don't know that, you know, snakeheads pose a could pose harm to the ecosystem where they release them. They don't know that they shouldn't be selling them. So that goes back to messaging and your audience. And, you know, us as biologists, I'm not the one to be, I'm not, I can't do that social campaign. And we haven't necessarily maybe embraced that part of society to, to help us spread that message. So it is a community effort. So it's nice to hear somebody like Steve say, well, I'll throw it back, but I am encouraging 
you know, that message to be spread, not to release them elsewhere. So that's that's what, how that message needs to spread almost organically instead of just from us saying, don't do it, don't do it. And, and, and just quick follow up. We too have some Facebook issues and our law enforcement has gone after those people as well. We've also got some neighbors who have taken video footage of people in their backyards raising snakehead and that stuff has gone to natural resource police as well. The, to Nick's point, you know, education is very important. I've learned in the regulation game that people aren't going to pay attention to regulations unless they wholly believe in that regulation. I mean, there's going to be some people who just trust the department and they're just going to do it because they trust the department. But if, we're, if we back it with a good education campaign as to why the regulation is necessary, then they will pay more attention to it. And if we waver in that um, justification, then they lose faith in that regulation and ultimately will start breaking the law. Thank you. All right, so any more? Yes, sorry. Here you go. Um, hi, this may be a little bit outside of the box or maybe not, but it's just an idea. I run a Jap fish tagging, volunteer fish tagging program back in Hawaii. And in Hawaii, I mean, we're, we're a Pacific Island state, right? So taking fish is subsistence, it's everything for them. Never heard of catch and release, <laughs> right? <laughs> So when I started the program, it was um, basically it, it was an interest in fishermen because they thought the Jap populations were going down. So with their help, I, the positive message is with your help, we can try to figure this out. So over, the, over time, when the data comes in, the tag and release, they're participating. They're the ones mm. that are getting the positive information back. I crunch all the numbers and feed it back to them in the form of a newsletter or something, in, in, the, in the form of a story, so that they can follow the story along and to see where their assistance in helping us get all this information um, will help us to conserve this resource, to, to sustain this resource. And lo and behold, we have people doing catch and release on Jack because they learn so much about, they become connected to that resource. And to me, that's what's missing. You're talking about the social aspect. We're always telling them, no, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. No, you can't. You know, the kids, any kid does not want to be told that. So I've always tried to keep it positive. I never do anything negative. I give the information to them, and then they decide. We had people to the point where they're, they're going up and down the canal on the beach telling people, let me see your cooler. You, you better throw that back. That's undersized. I'm uh -huh. like, please don't do that. You're going to get killed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, yeah. But it's changed the behavior. And it's interesting. I don't know if mm. doing an education program with your anglers, because you have a list. You, you guys have um, angler licenses yeah. that are required. We don't have a recreational fishing license yet. But it's amazing that the behavior can be changed. If you share with them the story that they fully yeah. understand, that helps to change some of the behavior. Uh, I don't know how to put this into the snakehead problem, yeah. but it's just a thought. And I don't know if you can, it, it'll take time. It takes somebody to look at the data, maybe an education specialist, and to tell that story back to the anglers. We're not sharing with them what we're seeing, and that's part of the problem. Yeah. Thank you, Annette, for your comments and thoughts. Uh, very interesting. Um, uh, Steven. No, I, I'm not shy. I was in talk radio for 20 years. This is killing me just not to have the mic the whole time. By the way, does is aloha hello or goodbye? Both. Okay, that's why I get confused. The, the, the outreach, I think, is really important in social media. Uh, I try to get involved in some of the social media pages. I think that perhaps maybe our you know our resource people uh, should also probably try to do that under the you know the name Maryland Department of Natural Resources Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries to answer the questions and the misconceptions uh, that I see out there all the time and as uh, you know in my position I end up getting into arguments where I say well no you don't have to kill a snakehead no you can't keep a live one and you go through all these things and 
in my position, I don't have the authority for that, but if, uh, if, you know, if you guys would monitor some of these social media pages, then it would be good, because then they would ask questions. I mean, once they realize that there's an authority there, they would ask questions, you get better cooperation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think with um, people moving them, that is going to be the biggest problem um, because with the advent of GoPros and the videos that I do, I mean, all of a sudden, you have this brand new game fish that comes from across the Pacific. You don't need a $60,000 boat, you, you know, fishing a kayak. That's what I do, I fish in a kayak. And they're a blast to catch, you know. So uh, that's going to be the biggest problem is, is getting people not to move them. Um, and I, I don't have an answer for it. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it's, it, I, I think there's just such a, an excitement to it that, you know, people want to go fish. I mean, I, people contact me daily um, wanting to get out there from... Thank you, Jonathan. Question in the back. Come to you. I've really appreciated the discussion so far. Um, something I, I hear a lot as an extension specialist across not just invasive species, but really all natural resource issues is that um, we have a, a people behavior that we need to change. And that's kind of the big sticking point in some of our management. Um, where also seems like we have a lot of science to understand the problem, but not continuous investment in some of the outreach. So at what point in time is the sticking point of this behavior becoming the problem, warrant of increased investment and outreach and extension to help address some of these issues? Because there's a lot of great examples of behaviors changing through investment and extension and outreach. Thank you. It was Tim, right? Yeah. So Tim asked the question, and if I can paraphrase it, at what point uh, do we, we shift our investment in our limited resources to doing more outreach and more uh, ex extension activities? You know, I know none of you are, that's not your job, but of course you have to do it. Well, so, yes. Snakeheads has been in the river since 2004. We actively started outreach really in 2010 uh, when they started becoming abundant. And I actually think we have shifted behavior. Um, you know, I talk to a lot of people at state fairs. I deal with Facebook. I deal with these people didn't want to handle a snakehead. They they threw them back. Bass anglers were among the first catching the fish, um, as well as haul sainers, and they'd report to me, and they would just cut the line. So I think you know, given the fact that people are harvesting snakeheads up here, and based on our creel work last year. About 50% of the people targeting snakehead were harvesting. Um, that's improvement over you know where we were you know 10 or 15 years ago. So I think in in some regard you know we've been somewhat successful. But I definitely see room for improvement in telling the story. And um, you know so I appreciate the comments. And we're always working on new media ways to to reach younger audiences. Um, if, if I could say something, I'm going to get out of the fish arena for just a minute. Maybe John might have some comments on, on our out outreach activities regarding snakeheads. But just to get to Tim's point, uh, I support that approach. And we have gone through that with a totally different species. If I could mention feral hogs, where it's been a, 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 <laughs> a major problem, and, and it's made mainly been related to and education and, in, and information and a trust issue that we've tried to develop with people throughout Virginia, and we're making some real good progress, and it's largely by turning the public to support us in that effort, so. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I have another question here from the audience, uh, unless I see a hand up. Uh, Matt uh, Shank from the Susquehanna River Basin uh, uh, Commission, and uh, so Susquehanna River, uh, they had their first report of one going through the lift, and uh, of course, so they have a whole basin there that is snakehead-free today, 
uh, just like Arkansas has many basins that are snakehead free. So the you know, question is, um, what are the you know, expectations in terms of what kind of studies should be conducted, in, you know, and hopefully this is you know, a 100 year study before they ever invade, or, or who knows, but what, what, what's your advice panel about what you know, the, those close by at risk watersheds, what they should be doing? I would say you can start by, you know, prioritizing those watersheds where you have maybe the most at peril species. We know Chesapeake log perch, that's the one I've mentioned now that they've showed up in a trip where Chesapeake log perch are, which are currently under review for the ESA listing. So there's obviously a concern there. Um, you can prioritize it. We already, the one benefit, if you will, of having all this research in the Potomac, but we've seen the spread. You saw it in Arkansas. They get to a point and they're going to spread. Now the Susquehanna, they're starting at the bottom. There's only one way to go, right? So you can prioritize if there's established surveys with the state or with you guys. Just start establishing some, some surveys and prioritize your areas where they're going to invade first. We also have unique fish blockages on the lower Susquehanna, so that should limit their upstream movement um, until, of course, they use the fish hook like they did at Conowingo. So you know, it's a, it's a different ecosystem, it's a different starting point because, you know, you're not going to have that, they're not starting in the center of the watershed and going to radiate out. So they will move upstream, we know that, and we, ha we have a lot more knowledge now, so hopefully we can use that knowledge and, and target those areas, either if there's at-risk areas and then also the most at-risk through invasion as well. So I would say start there, and the other benefit too is I think you guys probably have some set fish surveys, right, in the Susquehanna, so you're going to have that baseline data that Dwayne mentioned that areas that are going to be prone to invasion. Um, so that, that's a benefit too, at least. Um, so that if and when snakeheads show up, then you'll know and you might have some idea if things are changing. And I'd also suggest actively engaging bass clubs. Um, bass clubs, like I mentioned, they were catching snakeheads on the Potomac. There are bass clubs that fish out of Glen Cove on Conowingo Reservoir, as well as the lower part of the Susquehanna, right? Um, if, you have, if you want an alert system as to whether snakeheads are showing up in the system, that's one way you can effectively get to them. You have to reach the club itself. Um, and, you know, Matt, if you need a list of directors, of course, we permit them. So I'd be more than happy to supply that. And don't tell them snakeheads are bad. Tell them they might be bad and that you don't know. We don't know. But don't lie to them and tell them they're bad. All right, I've got another question here. Um, no, a comment from the audience? A question? Dennis Rickey from Mississippi. So my advice would be um, similar to the situation that we encountered in Mississippi when several of our oxbow lakes were invaded by silver carp and big head carp. And so the, the, one of the first questions is, what impacts are these fish going to have on our native fish community? They're low in the food chain, they're filter feeding. Okay, and so how are we going to assess that? Okay, so what historical sampling data do we have that we could use to look at pre-community uh, fish composition and post-carp composition? The only thing that we had was rope node data. So we started doing one acre rope nodes again and looking at the impacts. Now, that might not apply to you, but what historical fisheries sampling data do you have that you could characterize the population before snakeheads, and is it valid to do it again? And would that show an impact? Thank you. Yeah, I have a question for John. John, you're saying that um, we can't tell them that they're bad. We can't say the snakeheads are bad. The, what is the message that we give them where we don't want them to spread? Why is it that we don't want them to be spread? Because we don't know. All right? It's fair. It's the truth. We don't know. <laughs> is that even arguable? A, nu a nuisance based on what? There's, there's zero evidence in the history of the planet that there's done anything wrong. I'm pretty sure Mike Eichel presented some data on diet habits, and they're definitely impacting some starfish. 
So, so they're eating a non-native bluegill. So what? If they're not, if they're not competing with bass, what difference does it make? What would it matter if they're eating non-native bluegill? Non-native bluegill are native to North America, and if we we can't have a different standard for snakehead in the Chesapeake Bay as we do in the Mississippi River Basin, we can't say that snakehead are somehow worse in the Mississippi River Basin because that's where St. Clark is evolved and not in the Chesapeake Bay Bay. I mean, we can't. They're both non-native. Who cares where they evolved? Bluegill are not. Bluegill are native to North America. Can you pass the microphone yeah. to you? The microphone to you because I want to get some more. What? Yeah. <laughs> it's done now. John and I had our conversation. No. We will be on but Facebook Live soon. <laughs> but I agree. You probably don't want to refer to them as bad because that's subjective, right? But if you're interested in documenting where snakeheads are, you can just simply say snakeheads. And if you want to document, if you want to convince people they shouldn't spread them around, tell them it's against the law. And if they have a problem with the law, then they can go to the state and federal agencies and we can have that conversation um, in-house. And they will likely be talking to people like John and I and we'll have some backdoor discussions that get a little crazier than this. So, you know, that's, that's ultimately the, the, the phrase there. They don't want to break the law. They don't want to be charged with money. Yeah. They shouldn't do it. Well, and, and I think the other issue that we raised briefly a little bit before is, from my perspective, it may not be so much of an issue of uh, snakeheads competing or interacting with largemouth bass or bluegill or other non-native introduced fish. What I'm more concerned about I is the potential for them to escape into other systems that they have not invaded yet in the U.S., but if they do, potentially could have much more serious impact, or even systems where there are no fish currently and they could potentially survive. We've seen a few paper papers today or this week where in certain situations they are eating significant numbers of frogs or crayfish or other things. So. I'm more concerned in many respects about them getting to places where they don't currently occur. And that's, from my perspective, the reason not to move them around. Yeah, I think we have an agreement in terms of goal to contain them. We use that word containment, not, not exactly knowing how we're going to do it, but we'd like to do it. Now, I've got two audience members who've been you know, raising their hand and uh, getting ignored. So let me give you the mic. Joel? Can you say your name for the Joel Putnam. Yeah. Joel Putnam. Um, since I am from Wisconsin, the spread of silver carp has reached our border. And I know that our native, our, our, our neighbors are very concerned about that. Um, Minnesota is in you know, uproar over trying to make sure they don't go any further. So the concept of holding, they're, if they're acceptable in one place, that's one thing. But if, they're, if you're trying to contain them but you're allowing them to spread outside of a certain region, you risk actually impacting societies and other areas that are very concerned about them. So the question becomes, you know, how do you, where do you put that line of it's okay here, but it's not okay in, you know, what the next stream? And like you had mentioned, there are, um, you know, native species that we are concerned about being predated upon and eliminated. Right. Thank you. Yeah, in, 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 the, in the Chicago area, people are okay if they're in the Chicago waterway, but they don't want them in Lake Michigan, and you know, millions are being spent to, for, for barriers. Now, so Joel's question to the panel is about where did we draw the line, and Jonathan. I just yeah. want to mention one thing. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but the lady from Hawaii mentioned uh, right. stories. And it, why not educate the public on the endangered fish? And, and you know, these are, this is an area with an endangered fish, so if you bring snakehead, we could lose this fish forever. You know, I mean, I think that the focus is on the snakehead, but if somebody knows that, I mean, I, I'm not a scientist, obviously, but somebody knows that, hey, you know, there's this fish that's almost non-existent, you know, maybe we don't bring snakehead in here. And I mean, I think that might, might be the story you want to tell. No. Hi. Um, so there's been, regardless of whether we should be telling that snakeheads are bad, there's been some narrative that they are bad and that they 
that uh, killing them is encouraged by people who do catch them. Has there any has there been any consequences with people like uh, significant consequences with, let's say, people thinking they're catching snakeheads and they're catching a pun ton of bowfins and killing tons of bowfin? Have there been adverse effects like that? And Noah Bressman. Thank you, Noah. For the panel, no questions of mistaken identity. Absolutely. <laughs> Lots of them. Um, bowfin aren't that common in Maryland, but we do have a few in the Upper Potomac and the Upper Bay. Um, they've been confused with them, but we also have plenty of confusions with uh, long-nosed gar, um, you know, blennies, and um, in one rare case, sturgeon. So, um, you know, but that's why education has been so important. One of the reasons we put out videos and, and illustrations, you, you guys, Virginia was among the first to do that, and it was so important to kind of differentiate what those characters are, but again, it's reaching the public with that information has been a challenging. So for all the hoopla of 2002 and the media circus, the value in that is that it drew people's attention to what Snakehead were and perhaps from there, they could learn more about what they look like. No, I mean, the, the snakehead is no question is the poster child for invasive species. Um, but again, it, you know, you worry about invasive fatigue among the general public and our constituents. We keep telling them stuff's bad, you know, don't move it, don't, and I'm not saying that, you know, you said we're not encouraging the spread, obviously, we, we're trying to discourage it. Uh, so it, it's a fine line between telling misinformation versus trying to withhold facts versus encouraging, you know? So it, it's, it's difficult to juggle all those things and, and keep, keep folks focused. Thank you. We'll see you had a comment. Yeah, I have another question for John. Um, Virginia and Maryland are slightly different in that if you keep a snakehead in Maryland, that's your business. You kill it, you take it home. In Virginia, you keep a snakehead, take it home to eat it, you have a hotline. Do you have any data from that hotline? Anything that uh, we can glean? How that's how any numbers coming out of that? So yeah, what Steve references in Virginia, technically by regulation, you're still required to report a snakehead if you're taking it into your possession. That was something that we referenced the hotline. That was something that I was going to do away with actually last year, uh, but I decided to keep it just because simply other than some some entertainment value from going through and listening to those recordings a couple times a week. Uh, I do pick up a snippet now and then. It's sort of an early warning system. Uh, typically, we'll have the cases of mistaken identity. The both untold numbers of bowfin have been murdered in the name of killing snakeheads. Whether or not it's quantifiable impact on any populations, I, I doubt it. Maybe I don't know. There's no way to really measure that. But yeah, there's so many have given their lives a mistaken identity. But uh, in terms of the hotline, so. The only thing I can tell you is, is probably less than 1% of people are recording that. Did you report your last two fish that your client caught? <laughs> oh, you let them go. All right. Well, I know, I know a lot of people. Um, <laughs> a lot of people keep a lot of snakeheads. And uh, I, I didn't get a call from uh, uh, Kim or uh, Jason. With their anyway, um, <laughs> it, it's not being enforced. And, and I, I do get some calls, so we keep it going. But uh, other than that, the hotline is pretty much useless. We're still tight. Yeah, we're still tight. Yeah. Okay. No, just a quick note. Um, people have gotten much better at identifying snakehead. At least on our end, you know, people are not calling with pictures of dead gar. I think that at least calling them, you know, snakehead. I think that at least um, some of this information and outreach has worked to help, um, you know, convince people what they look like. And as the species spreads to other areas like Western Maryland, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, I think teaching people what they look like could be a very important part of that toolbox. Yeah. I've got several questions. Go ahead. Well, I just want to touch on John. There's a good phrasing of invasion fatigue or invasive fatigue. It's, so it's been 14 years, right? And everybody wants to know. And we've been obviously blown out of proportion, so perhaps. And so that's why it's almost like you have to redirect your messaging and telling people we don't know, that's an awful message. Nobody wants to hear that. That's why every time you still read in the paper today, you know, they can devastate an ecosystem. They can spawn multiple times, which has still not really been proven. We might see two peaks, but we've never actually seen one fish spawn here and one fish and the same fish spawn later. So, you know, it's we're at a, a kind of an interesting crux of time here that if 
that complacency still tends to grow and our messaging doesn't really change and become more effective and we don't get that behavior change that was talked about, then you know it might could spiral out of control. So that's why it's, it's good to address that now. Thank you, Josh, and thanks to the panel. Uh, I got a lot of questions. I'm trying to uh, keep tabs, but uh, if somebody would be so kind as to water our panel, I know they're getting dehydrated up here talking, uh, and I don't want them to leave because then we'll never get them back. So if somebody can bring them some water, that would be appreciated. I, I've got the questions, but uh, Air, uh, Richie, Richie uh, Erickman, USGS asked a question about besides harvest and uh, uh, toxicants, uh, are any other people doing integrated pest management approaches uh, considered for uh, northern snakehead here or elsewhere that you're familiar with? Integrated pest management where you're kind of uh, doing a real time warning and then reacting based on you know real information. And so it's not, not an all or nothing kind of eradication program. Essentially, the answer is no, but you know, uh, as Don kind of mentioned, we the snakehead management plan was finalized and accepted in 2015. You know, 11 years after it was supposed to be finalized and adopted. What happened with that is it got put together and then it never got formally adopted and never went on the federal register, so it was never really official. Now we have that document, so that could guide a rapid response effort. There's no funding tied to that document. It's okay. just sitting somewhere, unfortunately, right now. You know, people use it in reference to completing their own work, but um, integrated pest management is not necessarily part of the uh, management plan itself, but there is some rapid response efforts in there. Thank you. Thank you. And you've been waiting patiently in the back here. Please state your name when you ask your question. Thank you. I'm Sue Jewell, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I wanted to mention that um, in 2002, the Fish and Wildlife Service listed um, snakeheads as injurious. I know that was already mentioned. Uh, a couple of points I'd like to make. Um, we listed the northern snakehead, everybody knows that. But what I'm not sure everybody knows is at the same time we listed the northern snakehead. We listed the entire family of snakeheads, which is approximately 28 species. Three of them or so were already in the country. We knew that, and we knew we probably weren't going to stop their spread, except for maybe the one from Hawaii to the continent. Um, but the other 25 or so, depending upon the nomenclature, um, have not shown up in the United States. So we feel that the listing was successful. Um, in order for us to designate species as injurious, we have to justify why they're injurious. Now, unfortunately, I did not review the rule before I came here, and I don't remember exactly what our justification was. But if you want to know why we consider them harmful and invasive, just go to our rule, and you'll find that. Um, and the other thing is, unfortunately, last year we lost a lawsuit that says we can prohibit interstate transportation. So until last year, interstate transportation of snakeheads was prohibited. Um, now we have to rely on the state to prohibit, um, you know, possession or transportation. Great. Okay, so thank you. So that brings us a little historical perspective. Thank you for, for doing that, because that was back 2002, and the rule was, uh, at least in terms of my experience with Fish and Wildlife Service rulemaking, it was rushed, and the, the period for comment was shortened, and so it, it's kind of unheard of that we ever act that quickly anymore. It was an emergency, right, that was the word. Gail Norton was panicked and, you know, so uh, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of things going on in 2002. Yes? It, uh, just a quick note, it is still illegal uh, and under the Lacey Act, that you still get a federal fine for transporting a fish into a, another state if it's illegal in the other state. Right. You still get the federal fine. Still falls right, under so the, the state act. and a federal. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. So, did I have? Um, yes, Quentin. Thanks for so, warm, um, everybody. I, I'm just curious. Uh, so, and and I think Dwayne could speak to this about uh, about big head and silver carp. 
have the snakehead been in the system long enough that if there were a deleterious effect associated with the community, would we have already observed that effect? Thank you for that's Quentin. Quentin Phelps from West Virginia University asks, have the snakehead been in the system long enough in order to be able to quantify uh, impacts? And so someone's going to, I know several people are going to comment on this. I think that's a tough question to answer. Um, you know, when largemouth bass are introduced into areas, um, they can structure that community pretty quickly, but a lot of it depends on the biomass of the predator. And so in some areas you may see an effect, in other areas you may not. I don't know that we have the research on snakehead to really know how long they have to be in the system before we can document an effect. Um, but you know, we're, we're working on some projects to do that. We do have a historical data set from Blackwater Wildlife Refuge. Snakeheads have populated that system quite abundantly, and we're working now on a follow-up project to learn if the fish community's changed in that system, and we'll be working on that over the next year. I know John is doing similar work in his impoundments as well. Yeah, so some of the illegal stockings have actually maybe worked to our benefit in that those have occurred in our work area where we have uh, state-owned reservoirs that we have 50 to 80 years of data on that we survey annually. Uh, and of course, most of these are typical warm water reservoir fish communities with mostly introduced fish, but at the same time, it is a fish assemblage. It's been very stable over time. And now we have snakeheads over different years showing up in all these impoundments. Uh, and so I think moving forward, probably in the five to 10 year range, I think we could be pretty much, uh, it would be appropriate to be able to draw some early inferences. But, it, but it's still, I mean, it's still early in the process, you know. The blue cats, it took them, what, 20 to 30 years before we really saw some uh, trophic cascading effects, perhaps. Yeah. But uh, I think snakeheads being a, a, a smaller and, and lo shorter lived fish, shorter lived species, we maybe we'd see those impacts a little quicker. I would think after. I mean, 2004 is when we first saw them. They were here probably before 2000, 99, 2000. So, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're 20 years in to, to their, you know, self-sustaining presence. And uh, I would think if we were going to see some major shifts, and, and, and we're not measuring everything either. Um, so, but anecdotally and the stuff we are measuring, it, it certainly doesn't seem that that's happened. But, but the jury's still out. Yeah, <laughs> Go ahead. John's right. You know, that's a, 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 great, a great point that I don't think can be overstated. We are not measuring everything. We, we like to believe we're ecosystem managers, um, but we are not. You know, we don't, get, we don't have numbers on tessellated darter. We don't have numbers on banded killifish. There are forage fish that we don't measure. The Bay is now work, the Bay program is now working on a fish forage index uh, for striped bass, but they're only just working on it. So there are, you know, we are very limited in what we can say in our monitoring programs, but John's lucky he's got some surveys that kind of capture that assemblage. Um, but by and large, like in the Potomac River, we're not documenting every species we catch during our survey. I think that's a, a real important point, and, and a corollary to that is that some of the effects that we might have anticipated to see from snakeheads, if we were measuring all those other things, may have already occurred 20, 50 years ago b because of bass and other species. So mm. it's kind of like we, we shouldn't necessarily expect all the ecosystem level effects to come from snakeheads because a lot of it's already occurred long ago. Yeah, and I just want to follow up this. So it's only, it hasn't been that long. Yeah, one to two generation times if you're talking about a fish that can live 10 to 13 years uh, as best we know right now. Um, and kind of like what Ray just said, there's very litter in the literature where you can say this species declined because this species showed up because you have so many other effects going on. And then lastly, just to say that, you know, just because lack of obvious impact or at least to our knowledge does not mean that there is no impact, and that's why we say we don't know, right? It's not you sample a small stream for snakehead, as we've seen. That doesn't mean they're not there. You just didn't catch them. So it's a lot harder to prove negatives more than positives, of course. So, so don't forget that fact as well. Yeah. Dwayne's been reaching for the mic since the question was posed. Um, it, 
one of the things about the Asian carp invasion was that a lot of people were asking for effect information early on, and since we really only had the big head and silver carp in large rivers, which are dynamic, uh, stochastic, and um, they're highly in influenced by hydrograph. Uh, so, you know, we, it took us 30 years. We're really only just now starting to get enough data that we can say, yeah, we've got an issue here, and we're seeing substantial changes. In the ponds and, and lakes and, and more uh, lintic environments, you guys are going to probably be able to see if there's any effect much quicker. But in these large river systems, I don't expect you guys to be able to say, well, yeah, we have an effect or not have an effect for 20 or 30 years at minimum. Thank you, Dwayne. And uh, uh, Eric has been at a, a not different from that. So which you, you pick the which one you want to ask. So to move on, <laughs> my question here, which I guess was next, was this is Eric Riddle with the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, and I work on probably the newest ex range expansion for snakehead, at least in the Chesapeake Bay, which is the James River. We just discovered them back in April, May time period. Um, recently, we discovered a, uh, another snakehead that moved down through all the way to this, basically, city of Norfolk, which is almost the ocean front there, probably moved through one of these freshets. But for the groups that have tried to use some kind of eradication, rope known or whatever, dewatering on some of the smaller systems. Moving forward, I'd like those groups, Arkansas, I think there were some guys from New York yeah. that did it. Would you do it again? Was it worth it? Not only from uh, the aspect from removing or reducing the number of snakeheads in that system, but also from a PR standpoint. What were the benefits and costs you got from, from the public once you did that. Okay, so that's Jimmy and, and uh, 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 from Neil. We had real strong public support to eradicate the fish when it was discovered in the Piney Creek drainage. Uh, I was asked the same question yesterday and I'm, I'm gonna try to answer it basically the same way I did. From, from my standpoint, would I recommend an er eradication attempt again? Yes, I would. But the other side of that, you know, when you, they say hindsight's twenty twenty. From this whole group that's been in here for the last three days, or two days, whatever it's been, however long since we've been here, we have learned so much more about sampling snakehead, I think we would have had a better hold on, hey, they're already outside that drainage. And when you take that into effect, then the possibility of an eradication attempt gets real slim then because you've covered so much more area. So if they had been solely in that one drainage, knowing what we know design-wise on what we did, uh, I think we could have been successful if they were only in that one drainage. And, and the biggest thing is, is I think we learned so much of it was treated by helicopter to get that right percentage of rope known over that entire area, the helicopter dosage should have been increased dramatically because everywhere else, I think we were pretty successful at eradicating. And now we had New York over this way. Okay, New York experience and take your name, please. Mike Clarity from New York State. Um, we, interestingly enough, back in February, we had a tabletop exercise where we had a number of people come up to New York and um, participate in sort of a real world um, situation where, like Ohio presented yesterday, where they had some eDNA results. Turned out there was probably some marker problems with that. So, uh, but nonetheless, we went through a whole range of scenarios in that group. And I think it was clear in my mind that depending on the situation it, where we treated in, in Orange County and Catlin Creek, that was a headwater situation and we felt like we had a real good chance of succeeding and we also felt like we may have gotten early enough where they hadn't gotten out downstream. If either one of those two things weren't, you know, there, then we really would have to question whether we would do it again. But I think if we thought we could succeed, then yeah, we would go forward with it. Thank you, Mike. And that, my, that was my alarm telling me that it's only one question and, uh, and ju uh, Justin, yes, no. Yeah, this will be the last question. If you have other questions, um, 
get on Facebook, uh, they were streaming live, you know, ask these people questions uh, after the session. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, mine was really more of a comment regarding Quentin's question a minute ago. I'll okay, go ahead. Go back yeah, let's that. do that. Um, as far as Asian carp in Arkansas versus northern snakeheads and the timing, you know, you talk about 2002 is when those fish were probably released. Around the same time, 2003, 2004, uh, grad students from University of Arkansas Pine Bluff did quite an extensive study of Oxbow Lakes in the Lower White River, found very few Asian carp, uh, you know, and then northern snakeheads were found in 2008. We had 2008 flood, 2011 flood, Asian carp start to show up. It's all kind of happening at the same time, so I don't know going forward Especially, you know, we're just starting to get the first northern snakehead reports on the lower White River three years ago, post-2011, when they all start to show up, or all the Asian carp start to show up. So I guess my comment to that was, yeah, it's going to be hard to tell mm -hmm. A or B because it's all kind of happening at one time. Thank you, Justin. Pass it to Mika. I was going to add to Eric's question, too. You know, I still deal with folks, and they'll call, and you know, are you still interested in, in where snakeheads are? Well, absolutely. And they'll tell you some information, and then they'll kind of, kind of back out a little bit, and you get to inquiring further. And they're not really sure they want to tell you where they caught this fish at because the question is, are you going to come kill out the stream in my backyard? And so that's something I think we are overcoming: is that we we did do a massive eradication attempt that killed a lot of water. We are changing perspectives and we're telling folks, you know, they're here, we're dealing with them, we're not trying to eradicate them now. And you have to overcome those, the trust, as we keep saying, that perspective that we're out to, to kill every mm -hmm. single body of water that does or might or could have snakeheads at some point in the future. And I would add, too, that, you know, with our Operation Mongoose, although it was very successful in what it was, snakeheads are, are an interesting species and they bury up in the mud and they get in thick vegetation. And I was involved in 2008 as a college student um, working in the original rodeo that was looking for snakeheads. And there were areas we would go and throw out tons of rotenone and come back in heavily vegetated areas and there would be groups of minnows that would have found refugia in that type of system. And so, and so I feel like if, if minnows can figure out how to survive, they should be pretty susceptible to rotenone. But there's snakeheads that probably can find ways to hide and bury up in mud and, and get in thick vegetation that they can also avoid those types of treatments. So that's just something to think about going forward. Thank you, Mika. And uh, I do have to cut off the questioning because we're, we do have a schedule. Uh, they, don't, they may charge us too much more extra money if we stay here too long. But uh, you can mingle, you can talk, you can you know, have fun, do whatever you need to do before you get on a travel. I would like to take the opportunity and ask you to join me in thanking all our members of the panel for this uh, event. <laughs> and uh, thank all of the organizers. Everybody knows who you were. You know, we're, we can't wait for the second uh, International Snakehead Symposium to be announced. Uh, and is there going to be a, are you going to do a uh, picture uh, photo op with the panelists? Okay. Okay. Well then, then I, then we're adjourned.